I had two brothers that registered to vote for the first time in this last election. Yeah. And they voted for President Trump. And it was not a happy Christmas at the Hagen Farm, let me tell you. Minnesota is like fifth on the list of states really? um, for the existence of, of sex trafficking and sexual exploitation. So Two remarkable DFL women, Kirsten Kennedy from North Branch and Minnetonka's Lori Pryor. Mike McEntee and Ahmed Rawad welcome the congressional candidate and the legislator to our table. This is Democratic Visions. Here's producer Jeff Strait. Now, it is my take that the DFL Senate District 48 convention on March 17th was pulsating with as much energy as the one back in 2008, when Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama were courting Democrats nationwide. This convention chose delegates to the Congressional District 3 convention and also endorsed Carly Katsia Wathun to challenge Representative Jennifer Loon in House District 48B and incumbent Lori Pryor in House District 48A. A week later, as marches for our lives in St. Paul, Washington, and around the country were happening, Pryor and State Senator Steve Swazinski held a mid-session town meeting at Minnetonka High School. Later that same day, the uptake's Mike McEntee sat down with Lori Pryor in our studio. Lori is my state rep and Mike is my guy to go to for informed and smart political talk radio on AM 950. Hi, I'm Mike McEntee. I am joined here today by Lori Pryor, Representative Lori Pryor, who represents the Eden Prairie and Minnetonka area here in the Twin Cities. It mm -hmm. is her first uh, term in the legislature. Uh, we want to talk about the issues that you've been running into mm -hmm. there, as well as uh, the experiences you've had. I know you just came from a uh, town hall meeting this morning. Uh, you and Steve Swazinski, the senator who is, uh, represents the same area. What do constituents want to talk about these days? Well, first of all, we had a great turnout. I think that's part of the answer is the fact that people do want to talk. Um, this is not a time of apathy, which I find to be very encouraging and, you know, gives us hope. Um, does the gun bills that you're talking about, do any of those require court decisions first, or is that something that legislation... We began with talking about gun violence and how to prevent it, and also related to that, how to keep kids safe at school. And, you know, what we can do as a legislature, what we can do as a community, what we can do as a state to accomplish those things. And that was the number one topic this morning. And this was, even though there was a march going on in a different location where that was the focus, it took up most of our session this morning because that was something that people wanted to talk about. Now, guns seems to be one of those issues that shouldn't be partisan but has kind of turned partisan. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's an issue driven by fear. Uh, when, when people talk to you about guns, tell me about the, what you have had, what your interaction has been like, what your conversation has been like with them and others. Mm -hmm. So there's two groups right now, and the one group is talking about the absolute um, unequivocal need to have some, some gun safety legislation and that we need to have it now. And then there's another group that just as strongly insists that there should be zero legislation relating to gun safety and to firearms. The way it's being discussed is, is polarized right now. And that polarization, I think, is showing up in terms of a partisan divide in the legislature. So even though there are bipartisan bills out there relating to regulating firearms, um, because there's one party that controls the majority mm -hmm. in the legislature in both the House and the Senate, the Republican Party, those bills are not advancing through the legislative process. It doesn't look like we will be able to get them onto the actual floor into a public debate where everybody's representative can choose to vote yes or no to it, and then the public would know where we stand. Uh, it looks like they're going to stay tabled in the House. Now, Governor Dayton, I think when he was talking about this issue, addressed that and said, well, you know, we know those aren't going to go anywhere, so let's just set those aside. Do you think that was the right thing for him to do, or do you think it, it, you should have pushed for, hey, we do really need to talk about this? The governor has to take his position because He's the governor of all of the issues that we have to address in the Senate and the House. If he doesn't think he can move it forward, then I can understand where he would say, let's move on and deal with the other issues. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that as another representative, I don't feel that way. I feel like 
I need to keep talking to my colleagues. I need to keep talking to my constituents and encouraging them to keep bringing this issue forward because I think that we should talk about it in this session um, and this year. Talk about it. Do you have a position on some of the bills that are out there? I do have two bills right now that have been introduced that I'm a co-author of. And they're the two bills that um, Representative Dave Pinto is the author on. And one of them is the gun violence protection orders. And this is um, kind of a process that's already in place for other kinds of situations. But this is one saying very specifically um, that if somebody in a, in a household recognizes there's another person in the household or if there's somebody in a family that recognizes another family member is an imminent threat to either that themselves or to somebody else or other people, then they can go to the authorities. There's a judicial process for taking the firearms away from that person. So this is recognizing that there's a danger for people involved using due process and removing, removing those firearms, which will keep people safer. And we know we can, we can think of all those occasions where we've seen in the news where firearms were part of a crime and that they were deadly and that they could even be mass shootings and they could have been prevented if this, um, if this order had been in place and it was an option that people could have used. And other states have done this and have found it to be, it's a const it is constitutional. It doesn't threaten somebody's Second Amendment rights uh, because it's, safe, it's, it's stepping in only when there's a clear and present danger. Now there was this, both these bills got one hearing and, right. they, and they got tabled and during that hearing the, uh, the gun lobby showed up mm -hmm. and they testified that uh, uh, they represented all gun owners across the state of Minnesota and there was pushback on that saying that not mm -hmm. all gun owners are on the same page saying that there shouldn't be regulations. Uh, mm -hmm. Have you talked to gun owners? Do, do, do you mm -hmm. finding that? Gun owners do contact me and some, and I mean, I think that your, your summary is correct. You know, there's some gun owners where they say, yes, we do. I very much respect um, these kinds of regulations being put in, front, in place. And then there's other gun owners. Um, I get a series of emails and the subject line is saying, no gun regulation. Now, let's, let's back up here just a little bit because uh, when we talk about guns and we talk about a lot of issues, what we're really trying to talk about is of having a feeling of safety mm -hmm. no matter where we are, whether we are at a school, whether we are at a shopping mall, whether we're in our neighborhood, whether, mm -hmm. whether we're in our home. And it has to do with a lot of different things. And I know you are trying to address that on many different fronts. Mm -hmm. Talk to me about that. But we know that th we have other challenges other than, than gun violence. Um, we know right now that there is an opiate epidemic and opiates, that epidemic, that addiction to opiates, um, it's, it come, we see it threatening our safety and the health in different ways. First of all, we see people dying of overdoses, 400 um, in 2016 from overdose deaths. When people are not being able to get the prescription opiates, they're turning to heroin. There's just more crime surrounded um, from heroin addiction too, and also leading to deaths. One thing about this opiate challenge is that we are seeing bipartisan support for addressing it. We are working on together to try to come up with probably the most effective ways of dealing with it. So you begin with um, prevention, and that's to understand the prescribing of opiates and to make sure that they're not prescribed in areas if for things that they should not be prescribed for, which would lead to addiction. Um, so prevention, um, then also treatment of the addictions because it's an addiction mm -hmm. um, and it needs effective treatment. And there's um, a lot of people that are not getting into those effective treatments right now. And then the third thing is education. And so it's understanding, you know, at an early age um, what an opiate is and how it can affect you and how you can become addicted to it. And also understanding, you know, if there's someone that you know what they're going through if they seem to have an opiate, if they may be addicted to opiates. So there's a lot of education around this too. Now, the other day I was watching our president, Donald Trump, talk about opioids. Mm -hmm. And his approach to this was, well, you know, we're going we're gonna to put some rules and regulations out there. You mm -hmm. know, I, I want to deal with the drug companies. But he didn't really put a lot of money at that. What he really wanted right. to do was say, what we need to do is build a wall to stop all those drugs coming in from Mexico and mm -hmm. the immigrants who are doing this. And that struck me as really not the problem you just talked about. Can you talk about the difference between those two and how you think uh, what really needs to happen here? At the state level, we understand that it's, it's this, this system that we have to deal with. 
and that we have to deal with it in all these fronts and that you just can't um, find that, you know, that one magic solution like building, building a wall and we can stop all of it because um, the heroin and opiates can come from so many different sources that we can't shut down. But what we can shut down is the addiction to them. Oh, we kind of got into this talking about making people feel safe, safety. Mm -hmm. Are there other issues kind of under that banner that you look at that uh, you and you think the legislature should be tackling? Mm -hmm. so we've been talking about um, sexual exploitation. Mm -hmm. What we've come to understand is that uh, the young people that are being coerced, forced, seduced, whatever it is, into a life of sexual exploitation, sex trafficking, um, it's happening at an early age. And it can be in that age range of 12 or 9 to 14 that young people are being recruited into this and, and forced into this. And it starts with the vulnerabilities. Mm -hmm. um, and it can be a sexual abuse that they've been suffering, makes them vulnerable to be caught up in this life. Um, it can be just from poverty. The perpetrators are able to recognize those vulnerabilities and pull these young people into these lives that once they're in, once they're trapped in, is almost impossible to escape from. This is an issue that we, are, we talked about in this last legislature, and we had one way of addressing it to prevent it was to start teaching about what sexual exploitation is, to start teaching it in schools. Mm -hmm. And to, first of all, we talked about just giving schools permission to teach about it, because now some schools say, well, that's, that's off. We can't talk about that. So that's too serious. That's, that's too grim. Parents mm -hmm. won't, won't be happy with this. Um, but we're actually moving towards even mandating that schools teach this, um, saying that schools much, must teach it. Of course, if we mandate it, uh, we have to put some funding and resources behind it so it will be done in, um, in a way that's most effective and doesn't take away from other parts of education. So it's raising the awareness to say this is something that's going on in Minnesota, all over Minnesota, and we have to start addressing it. And I have heard that, um, that Minnesota is like fifth on the list of states Really? Um, for the existence of, of sex trafficking and sexual exploitation. When you, when you talk about having to bring this into the schools, mm -hmm. do you have the support of teachers and mm -hmm. the parents when, when you bring this up? How, is, how, how does that interaction happen? The, the exciting part of this story is that it came to us, it came forward to us um, from a group of girls, um, high school juniors, and they're in a group called uh, Girls United Minnesota. And they bring in speakers, and one of their speakers talked about sex trafficking. And they realized that it had it was going on in their school. That there, a couple years before that, there had been a girl that trafficked another girl in their high school. Uh, so they said, you know, we're not going to let this stand. We're going to do something. And they were the ones that came to me and to came to other legislators to say, we want to learn about this at an early age so that we can prevent this from happening again. And if we see it happening, we would know how to help somebody that's being um, exploited this way. Teachers and uh, administrators at their high school said, we support you in this, and, but we would like to see the legislative backing for it too. Girls United Minnesota um, were the driving force to get this piece of legislation heard. And so where we stand right now, it was heard both in the House and the Senate and our education committees. Right now it's part of the omnibus education bill, and it was also passed as a standalone bill that is sitting on the House floor right now and on the Senate floor and could be called up before the end of the session uh -huh. um, to be passed into law. And I can add, talking with the Girls United, they are inspiring. They are committed and they are articulate and, and clear about what the issue is and also about what their goal is to accomplish. And what's, um, what's very motivating is that there's a sense that they're, they're not going to take no for an answer. Let's talk about a close cousin to this. Mm -hmm. You know, we've heard a lot about the Me Too movement, the mm -hmm. sexual harassment. Right. I've, I've, uh, I've watched, uh, I've watched Aaron, Representative Erin Murphy stand on the floor and talk about uh, how she grew up and working as a waitress and was sexually harassed. We've heard mm -hmm. stories of many women coming forward at the legislature talking about how this is a problem. I mean, it, it permeates society, but the legislature is trying to police itself on this. How mm -hmm. are we doing on that this time around? It's, um, we did do a training um, in the first uh, week of session. There's 
there was probably mis mixed evaluations of how effective that training was. But I personally, I think that was better that there was a training than that there wasn't a training. And that I think that there is um, a different awareness of their, this issue than there has been in previous years. And we know even now, everybody understands there's consequences for uh, sexually harassing. Tony Cornish is no longer a state representative. And that's, I think, a positive development. So I think that we've changed in a way that we can't go back. Um, or we can't go back quickly. Right. <laughs> I right. should reframe that. We might go back, but it won't be quick. And what we need to do, though, is to keep moving forward on this issue. And we do need to have um, processes in place that will um, be, be, um, be so that we're able to deal with the issue more quickly and more effectively than we are right now. We, we in the House, House DFL, um, we're talking about having an independent group be able to investigate um, harassment claims. Because right now the problem is there's this overlap between partisan politics and, um, and, and, and power, power politics between individuals. And it, that's a bad dynamic. So we're thinking that having an independent investigation of things and an independent look at things is, is going to be more effective than to keep it within the party structure. Because right now if there is, you have to make an ethics uh, mm -hmm. complaint and that has to that has to it goes to a committee that is split between the Republicans and the Democrats mm -hmm. and too often it seems like ethics things boil down to partisan issues mm -hmm. and I think that may be one of the reasons that people are hesitant to come forward because the mm -hmm. current system really doesn't work very well I, I, I think that's true there just always needs to be a process in place that fits the environment that you're working in Let's talk about being new to the legislature because this is your first term. I mean, mm -hmm. this is uh, the second year of the first term, but mm -hmm. you've, you've had a chance here to uh, kind of see how things work. Some people always say, if you like sausages, don't go to a sausage <laughs> factory. You like politics. What's it been like now being in the legislature? It's, it's very stimulating, I guess, is part of it. And I, so I, I, I think I, I was close enough to the process before that I didn't have... Um, large illusions about what the process was like. So I had some idea about how things work. When I was in high school, that's when Richard Nixon resigned after, I'm not afraid to date myself, when he resigned um, because of Watergate. So it's hard to go down from there in terms of what you think about politics, because mm -hmm. uh, that certainly was a low point in our country um, when the President of the United States had to resign because of um, what he had done as a politician. So I. So I've been moving up since then. I think one thing that I found, though, as a new legislator, and that's probably the most challenging, is that you really have to know about everything, or you have to know something about everything and, and not ignore it, because um, there's issues all over the state, and you can't just say, well, the only thing that matters now is gun violence and sexual harassment, and just focus on those. You have to keep talking about mowing ditches. And, and you have to talk about muskie in, in um, Northern Lakes, and you have to talk about nutrition in schools. And there's just so many issues that you, that you have to follow and be able to think about. That's what the learning curve is, and that's what the energy curve is, too, is, is to feel like you can get quickly get to speed and um, be able to engage in an intelligent way about a wide variety of issues. Now, uh, the DFL is in the minority this, mm -hmm. uh, this session. It is uh, probably something that a lot of people feel frustrated with because there are so many issues that get pushed to the side or mm -hmm. don't get pushed through. Are you frustrated about that? Do you, do you find that frustration? And B, how do you see that that might change in the future? Well, things swing away from whosever, whichever party has the presidency. Mm -hmm. And it can be, 10 votes is not unusual to see a swing of that magnitude. So that would change the, it would change, the, 11 seats would change the dynamics, change the majority in the House, and that would change the dynamics of the legislature. And then the agenda would change. We would be changing the conversation with a different party in control of the House. Instead of having um, gun violence prevention on the table, not talked about, not advancing, mm -hmm. It's something that would advance. Even if the bills changed from where they are right now to be more of a compromise position, um, they would at least be advancing and being worked on to improve them. And now they're not. They're just, they're just sitting there. 
as being part of the minority, working with a Republican majority, do you find that are Republicans listening on any points? Do you find that there is compromise? Mm -hmm. Is there bipartisan work going on? Because so much of us hear about, you know, gridlock and nothing, mm -hmm. it's one party or the other. What's your experience there? Well, you know, as when we're talking about um, these issues, the, the sexual exploitation, that was a bipartisan issue because it would not have been heard in the Education Committee if it didn't have bipartisan support. It would not have passed the Education Committee without bipartisan support. The chief author is a Republican. So it is, it is an issue that um, everybody agrees we need to address. And when we're talking about um, making our schools um, more safe and secure, there are provisions that have bipartisan support. And it's, um, it's being worked out what's the most effective way of doing this. But addressing that part of it as an issue does have bipartisan support. Lori, thank you so much for the interview, Representative Lori Pryor. If you're interested in what's going on at the legislature, I suggest another resource, which is theuptake.org. We live stream all of the meetings that are happening at the legislature on television. You can watch them live. And of course, that's powered by your donations. Transparency in government is important, so help us out there. And if you'd just like to talk politics, join me over at AM 950 Radio. I'm on from 4 to 5 o'clock every day. So we'll talk to you on the radio. North Branch Mayor Kirsten Kennedy is seeking DFL endorsement in her bid for Congress. Rick Nolan is retiring. The congressional race in the Minnesota 8th will again be one of the most competitive competitions in the country. Donald Trump did well here in 2016. I'm doing this because I believe in it, and however it turns out, it's a win because... Kirsten Hagen Kennedy says she will follow Nolan's right common sense lead in the 8th CD. She recently met with our colleague, Ahmed Thurwat. We have more women running for office right now in the United States than ever in our history, and it's not as easy for a woman to decide to run for office. Men, I just want to say, they just go, okay, I'm going to do it, and they go. Women oh, how's Abraham going to get picked up after school and how am I going to do, we want everything to be perfect. Life is never going to be perfect. And so you just have to go, okay, I'm going to give it my best shot. And then you do it. Well, somebody, I think she was running in Alaska and she said uh, one way for cutting down on uh, sexual harassment from politician is more women in the office, right? That's correct. <laughs> but I want you to know I cannot see Russia from my window. A Norwegian-born American Kennedy says she will fight for public and vocational schools and educational equity. She will advocate for teacher training and up-to-date learning technology. Kirsten Kennedy is on Facebook and has a website. I think for me what I've seen is that it's taking what I do in North Branch and uh, taking it to 26 or 27 more thousand square miles. Minnesota's 8th Congressional District is large, diverse, and focused on the future. As you know, mining is a big topic in northern Minnesota. Fishing rights, we have Mille Lacs and other, um, Mille Lac is the biggest one where we have some issues with the stocking and um, some treaties that were made. Jobs is always big, high-speed internet. Uh, even in North Branch, in the city, we have really Do good... Do they get internet there? In North Branch, in the city, but as soon as you go a mile out, not so much. And so that really hurts. Uh, healthcare is a big deal. We have healthcare systems closing in Rush City. We have our health Fairview's closing down their clinic. And a year ago, they lost their grocery store. And so we have these food deserts and healthcare deserts and farming. We have family farms that are shutting down because they just can't make ends meet. And so I think it's a looking at and restructuring um, our fundamental economy in the United States and working hard at that and looking at how we can move towards making sure that we have some equalization funding for our schools and for our citizens and frankly we have a house the housing shortage in uh, Congressional District 8. Really? We do. So the people actually want to go and live there? Well one or two. Maybe from Minnetonka. Wow. <laughs> so, you mean, uh, it, it seems like, a, you know, a, a mainstream uh, problem. And it, I mean, the last Nolan, you know, to, for three terms before that. And, uh, and I don't know how the transition will, uh, will take place. Do you like sit down with them and they tell you 
a little bit about uh, some of this issue and how to deal with these issues. Absolutely. You have a transition team, right? You have, so you get through to uh, the first step is April 14th in Duluth. Hopefully there will be an endorsement. There are five candidates running, including myself. And then once you go to that, you have the general election. The Republicans already have a candidate, uh, Mr. Stauber, and so he's been campaigning for a year. So whoever does this, it will be very short time. And it was a very close race last time. I know that Rick Nolan will support the endorsed candidate or the person he chooses. There will be a transition team. And frankly, I think Nolan's staff is excellent. I would just turnkey his staff. Oh. and keep everyone that works for him right now and then move forward because the time is too short to be already looking for staff and I have a great um, campaign, pan t campaign team. My dad's been out campaigning with me, Knut Hagen, 80 years old, and he said this year he uh, shot his first 10-point buck and as he was sitting there he said, now I can die, Shishton. <laughs> and I said, uh, okay, well, he's not dead yet, I just want you to know. And... Um, and issues like my parents, they've both worked their entire lives and sometimes they have to go to food distribution centers to make ends meet. That shouldn't happen. Um, people that have worked a, hard. We are a very wealthy, rich we are. country. We are, and so I'm not sure how to answer that question, but I know that no one should work three jobs and not be able to have a roof over their head. I mean, well, operating from Washington, that's a, that's a, that's a change than operating from North uh, Branch. It is. I mean, how do you prepare yourself for this, uh, going to Washington and dealing with the politics of this is the real deal, this is where real, the sauce has is, uh, is been made? This is where the magic happens? Is yeah. that what you were going to well, say? Well, not magic, but... It's hard work. Hard and I work. think what it is, is frankly, I would be a freshman there, so... You get perks? My no perks. You get no perks. But what you do get to build... They show you where build, the bathrooms are? Or the, the, oh, yeah. They show you where the bathrooms are in your offices. That's what they that's do. That's it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe a map how to get there. But um, what you do is you build relationships. That's the first thing that you can do, right? You have a staff that you work with well and you treat well. My nephew, Drake, who has Down syndrome, he's 18. He's been out of the campaign trail with me and he'll stay through. Uh, people with disabilities, I just go... You know, nations, sometimes we have to be clear that we go to lead, hopefully, for public service, not like the election that's happening in Egypt and, <laughs> and well, Russia. No just public Russia service. just had one, too, yeah, right, well, where it, anyone it. who thinks differently and, and we need to make a decision to do, I, I believe, what is right and work across the table. I had two brothers that registered to vote for the first time in this last election, oh, yeah. and they voted for President Trump. And it was not a happy Christmas at the Hagen Farm, let me tell you. They're still your brothers? <clears throat> They're still my brothers. We can't change our siblings. But we have to figure out why. And I think we were talking earlier, I think we need to ask more whys yeah. instead of always thinking we automatically know the answer. Minnesota's 8th Congressional District Democrats meet in Duluth on April 14th. They will attempt to endorse a candidate to replace Rick Nolan. Up or down, Kennedy says she'll abide by that endorsement. So when you have high schoolers and middle school schoolers vote for a president like Trump, they're hearing it from their parents and their parents are afraid or they feel marginalized. They don't know what to do. And so there, I believe p people pick someone that they think can champion for them. And I really think at its base, politics is meant to be how we care about each other. Public service. Sometimes we forget. Any split-second decision can take it all away. And I want to make sure that our country is a, moves forward and we have people in Washington, D.C. that are willing to work with others, even others that think differently, and that we focus on hope, right, instead of fear, that we remember who we are as a country instead of forgetting. I know we're, we're not uh, as old as Norway or Egypt <laughs> or Italy, okay, or really almost every other place in the world. <laughs> <laughs> but we can get it right, and I think we can get it right. We I can learn also we from... We can learn, and we know, have to not be willing to learn. No. You home. know, um, is there a chance for you running for an office for someone who lives in uh, Minnetonka like I do uh, to vote for you? Well, I'll have to get back to you on that. Democratic Visions is handcrafted by volunteers from Eden Prairie, Hopkins, Minnetonka, Edina, and Bloomington. Watch us on select cable systems and on our YouTube channel. This is Carol Sundstrom.